World Bank Chief Economist Justin Lin charts the near future of the Chinese economy. We'll be back after this. Welcome back. You're watching World Inside with me, Tian Wei. The program is coming to you Monday to Friday on CGTN. Forty years after reform and opening up, China has now grown into one of the world's leading economies. But challenges and problems persist. Chinese President Xi Jinping attended a reception ahead of the National Day, and Premier Li Keqiang reaffirmed the country's resolve to create a better business environment for both the domestic and international communities. He said reform is the fundamental driving force behind China's development, and development is the base and the key to solving all of China's problems. This comes amid the escalating trade war between China and the U.S. Washington continues to threaten even more tariffs on more Chinese imports, while negotiations between the two countries have stalled. Earlier, I spoke with Professor Justin Lin, former World Bank chief economist and director of the Center for New Structural Economics at Peking University. He shared with us his insights on China's trade tensions with the U.S. and how the country's economy would fare in this uncertain time. Professor Lin, welcome to CGTN. Good morning, Wei. One of the things people are asking is about the global supply chain. Where is China going to be as a result of this apparent trade war between China and the United States on the global supply chain? Well, certainly I hope trade war will be over soon because trade is always a win-win for every country. The trade world currently what we observe will affect the kind of process and especially China is a major producer of manufacturing goods in the world. So China get a nickname of the world factory. And uh, this kind of modern manufacturing rely on supply chain. So if this trade war prolonged, certainly it will hurt a little bit. But China is a large country. So the impact will be there, but I think it will be observable. We hope for the best, but we prepare for the worst. How is China prepared for the worst? Well, certainly China has a lot of uh, domestic you know, demand, and uh, we can rely on domestic demand to absorb some of this you know, diversion. And uh, China also trade with European country, Africa, South Asia, Central Asia, East Asia, and uh, so you know, the world is only between China and the U.S., but we have so many friends in the world. Mm. And uh, we can, you know, work together to arrange, you know, uh, globalization even without the participation of the U.S. The trade war, when it comes to the amount or the quantity, is one thing. But the most important thing is what's going to be the nature of the relationship between China and the United States, the two largest economies in the right. world. And therefore, what does it mean? for the world economy as a whole. Meanwhile, it is also about confidence. The confidence, believing in globalization, the confidence about the global economy in the future. Yeah. About that part, is there any evidence, Professor Lian, helping us to understand where things are going? We need to see the foundation of relation. The foundation of relation is that will this relation help each other improve the living of the people in both country and uh, fulfill the dream of the people in both country. And uh, our productions, our industries are in the low, medium, value added sectors. Yes. And the U.S. is on the high value and uh, added sectors. And so our economy comes to complementarity. That means we, you know, in a trade, we export, you know, low prices, different necessity, consumption good to help the consumers. Trade is still a win-win because you know, the mechanism of trade, when countries are on a different income level, okay. they're based on the different competitive advantages. 
China has comparative advantage in multiple intensive sectors, and the U.S. has comparative advantage on higher value added capital intensive sectors. But when our income reaches the same level, then trade will rely on specialization. So trade will always be good for everyone, and that is the reason why globalization has been a trend in the world, mm. and uh, that allow that every country to have an opportunity to improve the efficiency of their economy and def and uh, you know update the different standard of their people. We understand there are certain concerns, let's just say, in Washington. When China is developing and we see discomfort in some other places as a result of purely China's development, what can China do, really? If China grow, China's market will be larger, and China also provide the opportunity for other countries to share this kind of prosperity. When China grow, China demand for higher value added, sophisticated manufacturing good will also increase. Mm -hmm. China's you know, demand for luxury consumption good will be increased. So from what I see, you know, the rise of China or the growth of China, certainly first, it's a legitimate you know, right for Chinese people. Certainly, it's also a legitimate right for the people in every country. Mm. And in a globalized world, this kind of dynamic growth in one country not only help the country itself, but will also help the other country to have larger markets and to grow together. Mm. So I think we should that people understand it's our common interest. And so, you know, we can join hands to share this pr prosperity together. Mm. Robert Zolik, who you used to work with when you were serving for uh, the World Bank, yeah. was suggesting that we should look beyond the current administration in Washington and look at the real nature yeah. of the economies between the two countries yeah. and the nature of relationship between the two countries. Yeah. Professor Lian, how can we look beyond when you have quite an obstacle right here? What kind of vision does it take for Chinese economic policy makers and academics such as you which is leading the thoughts about China's development here in this country. We should not overreact to you know, the Trump daily, administration's the right, daily, yeah. and the daily issues. Yeah. No matter what kind of situation happen you know, outside China, we should not you know, slow down what we need to do. When it comes to China, the biggest challenge is not coming from outside China, but rather how China upgrades itself. Right. So that comes to the reform and opening up issue. Yeah. Professor Lian, you've been instrumental in pushing forward China's reform and interaction with the rest of the world. But Professor Lian, there have been complaints about China not necessarily acting fast, not necessarily acting according to its promises over the years, particularly when it comes to the opening part. Um, what do you say, Professor? You know, we should not, you know, judge uh, the reform programs according to some kind of blueprint based on textbook, mm -hmm. right? Because certainly China adopt, adopted a gradual piecemeal approach mm -hmm. for the transition. And uh, in the 1980s, 1990s, Country adopt those kind of comprehensive shock therapy, try to do privatization, marketization, stabilization, liberalization simultaneously. On the paper, they seem to, you know, introduce the perfect institution, perfect mm. system. Yes. But their economy collapsed, stagnant, hit by crisis all the time, and their economic performance measured by the average annual growth rate. It was lower than pre-transition. And China adopted this kind of gradual piecemeal approach. And uh, on the one hand, continue to provide some transitory protection and a subsidy to the old capital intensive sector, which went against China's comparative advantages. Mm -hmm. By that, China maintains stability. But on the other hand, also liberalized the entry to the new labor intensive sectors, which China and, uh, had comparative advantages. And, uh, government facilitate that 
by improving infrastructure based environment in the special economic zone, export processing zone. So quickly turn those kind of competitive advantage to competitive advantage. That's right. So China can grow so fast. And not only so, the dynamic growth in the new sectors also create a condition mm -hmm. to reform the older sectors. Because the reason why the older sector require protection and subsidies was because they win against China's comparative advantage. At that time, China was a low income country, capital was scarce, but they were in a very capital uh, intensive sectors. That's right. And they are not viable in an open competitive market. But after 40 years of reform, China now is a high middle income country, capital is not scarce anymore, and uh, sectors which used to be against China's comparative advantage now become China's comparative advantages. But then that means we could do it faster? Uh, well, Professor? that has to see because, you know, if we can do faster, certainly it will be desirable. But stability is always the foundation. One of the things people are concerned these days is what's going to happen to the international system. Yeah. You yourself worked in the World Bank for yeah. consecutive years. Can China and some of the others figure out some kinds of solutions in order to make sure that people still have confidence in the international system and confidence in our global economy, Professor? Well, I think that's a very important issue. As I say, globalization is a win-win for everyone. And after the Second World War, the international architectures you know, is, has paved the foundation for globalization. And I think the challenge is not globalization is not good. Mm -hmm. The challenge is that China, you know, benefit from this globalization, China grow very fast. And uh, now the weight in the global economy shift. I think the globalization is, you know, a platform for every country to develop their economy according to their competitive advantages and by that they can be efficient. Mm. And at the same time, it also provides an opportunity for a country to transform from poor agrarian economy to modern industrialized economy and a crime the industrial leader to, you know, move from low income, middle income to high income. Mm -hmm. And in this, you know, entering to this new era, China will become a high income country, China will lose comparative advantages in traditional labor intensive sectors and uh, those kind of sectors will be uh, on the process to be relocated to other countries. Mm -hmm. And because China is a large country, right. China has 85 million you know, job opportunity in those kind of sectors. And that 85 million will be almost possible to make all the low income country to kickstart their industrialization simultaneously. Mm -hmm. But the mining country is infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Because if you want to have your goods to reach global markets, you need their power, you need their role, you need their port facility. And the China's very role initiative will you know, contribute to the infrastructure connectivities. So I think that uh, you know, the developing countries should work together to you know, capture this opportunity. And uh, if the developing country can grow faster, they will become the larger market for high income country. Right. And that will enable high income country to continue to maintain higher growth and achieve you know, further prosperity. Even if that means more disputes at the WTO, even the deadlock at the WTO, even that means World Bank, IMF express concerns or suspicions about China's goals when it comes to future development through the globalization. China is still going to stick to its version of globalization. Is Certainly. that what you're saying? Certainly. Yeah. As simple as that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor okay. Lin, for being with us. I okay. really appreciate it. Justin Lin Yifu, one of the most well known Chinese economists.